Okay, we're live. We are live. Jennifer says we're live. Awesome. Okay. Well, hopefully we have a good portion of uh, of you all here already with us in our first few seconds on this uh, live event. But I know that uh, people are going to be trickling in probably over the next few minutes. So I won't try to rush through the introduction of uh, who we are and what we're all doing today um, with and for you um, who have tuned in, who are tuning in. So. Welcome, first of all, everybody to, this is, this is called the Real Talk uh, panel discussion um, made up of some incredible people, uh, my co-panelists and my co-host Jennifer at Unlimited Tomorrow. This event is being put on by Unlimited, Unlimited Tomorrow. Um, as I'm sure all of you know, Unlimited Tomorrow is the incredible group of people um, headed up by Easton LaChapelle who have developed prosthetics and are developing affordable, incredible prosthetics that are changing lives and improving lives of people like all of us on this panel, um, and many who you can't see. Uh, John Lynn's waving his uh, through him. So, all right, cool. So, yes, what is, what is this? This is a moment where we all, with some type of limb difference um, in the, on this panel, will take about an hour to address important and uncomfortable and honest questions that are commonly asked um, by anybody, um, even ourselves. Uh, how, you know, how, to, how do you deal with this? How do I parent my child? How do, how do, you, how do kids relate to each other if they have a limb difference, et cetera, et cetera. That's what we're doing today on Unlimited Tomorrow, and Jennifer have uh, facilitated this moment, so thank you. Uh, I think this is going to be really special. Um, so. What we have next, I'm looking at my agenda, so I apologize, I apologize because I have to pick up here once in a while. Um, so, oh, and I will mention this, uh, we are live in three different platforms. Also, great job, Jennifer, at Unlimited, she's here, by the way, I will introduce her in a moment. Um, but great job doing what you're doing to make us make this available live on uh, Facebook, on YouTube, and Instagram. So, well done. And then, of course, the main platform, if you pre-registered, you're looking kind of at a different, from a different angle. Nice big HD view, so cool, and uh, that's I'm sure that's going to be awesome to watch back. So, okay, awesome. So, and then the other thing, very important note, definitely we want you to engage with us as we're talking in the comments section. Um, so, wherever you're watching, uh, whichever platform you're watching, definitely please leave your comments and questions as we're talking. And in the last 15 minutes of this uh, panel discussion, is what we're going to dedicate to answering, getting to as many of those questions and, and comments as we can. So don't be shy. If you're hanging out with us for the next hour, you committed the time, which we're so grateful, and we have um, committed this time for you, and we want to talk with you and with each other, with each other and with you at the same time. So awesome. Okay, well, let's talk about who in the world is here. <laughs> um, this is a really fantastic group of people to whom I feel connected, even though we don't know, all, all of us don't know each other personally, but we are all connected um, in this kind of unique way. So what do we have? Let's see. Okay, so I guess I'll introduce myself first. Am I to do that? <laughs> yes, I'm Abby. Um, I am uh, privileged to co-host uh, this live event with uh, Jennifer Barbic, who I will introduce her in a moment again, uh, who is the VP of Marketing. Limited tomorrow. I, I have, uh, some of you might have might follow me on socials. I, I basically just share my life and how I play drums and other things on uh, my YouTube and social accounts. And so that's that's who I am. Um, and well, as a matter of fact, I don't have two hands too. That's that's a part of this. Um, and <laughs> um, and uh, cool. So, and then also I am the proud owner recipient of a true live from a limited tomorrow. So that's me. And then we will start with the rest of the panelists. Start. Let's go ahead. The way I see it is we'll just start from the person directed to my right. So starting with Alexis. Who are you, Alexis? <laughs> Who am I? My name is Alexis. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I live in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And I was born without my left hand. This is my stump, I call it. And I am a proud True Limb owner as well. 
And I have a YouTube show called Stump Kitchen. I'm on all social media channels as well, just like putting out content and uh, about limb difference and visibility. And I'm a parent as well. Okay, and we'll go, thank you, Alexis, and we'll go on to you, Jonathan. Oh, we can't hear you, Jonathan. I was expecting ladies first, but I, I guess I can go ahead and jump on in there. Uh, my name is Jonathan Snyder. I'm the National Adaptive Golf Director for the United States Adaptive Golf Alliance. Uh, I love competing in golf. I love including all individuals with disabilities in the game of golf. Um, I'm engaged. Uh, we're getting married in September. Very excited about that. And uh, I'm also the vice captain of the Cairns Cup team in which we'll be going overseas to London to uh, compete in a Ryder Cup style event. I'm also very, very proud owner of uh, a true limb from Unlimited Tomorrow. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, all right. And yes, uh, it just, I don't know if it, how everybody else is seeing on their screen, so I'm just kind of scrolling along clockwise. That's how I'm picking through here. Um, okay. So thanks, Jonathan. On to you, Christy. Christy Gray. I am an upper extremity amputee uh, from a traumatic, it was a boating incident. I work at a school. I'm the front office, the face of the school. I enjoy, I do enjoy my job. I love it a lot. I'm a wife, a mother, and then I do, uh, I kind of share some, some insights on TikTok, YouTube, and Instagram. Um, yeah, I am in the process of getting a awesome. freelance. Awesome, so that's on your way for you. And yeah, I had to call out your red dress. Looks yeah. stunning. I love it. <laughs> awesome. Okay, Christy. Well, thanks. I'm okay. I'm gonna pop it on over to Kirsten. Can you hear me? Hello, uh, my name is Kirsten Kelly. Um, I'm a singer, songwriter, a model, and an actor. I live in LA, but I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um. I'm a huge reader, just as a fun fact, I went to Berklee College of Music on a full scholarship based off of performance, and um, I don't have a true limb, but I'm also in the process of getting one right now. Awesome, that's exciting. Um, all right, and then we have uh, Kayla. Hi, my name is Kayla, Kayla Maria G, and I am a professional model and dancer. I dance at one of the top commercial studios in New York City, which is really, really great. Um, dancing is my passion, and I love also advocating for our community through Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, all the platforms that we know and love. And I'm also a true limb user as well, and this is mine, which is really, really cool because I was able to really go in depth in the type of design that I like, um, which I found to be really, really special. And yeah, and a fun fact about me is I'm obsessed with Harry Potter. <laughs> yes, that's uh, I think probably for the majority of people involved in this event probably feel the same. <laughs> um, but uh, cool. So let me say this before I introduce Jennifer. This is something I actually skipped over before, and that is, um, as many of you watching know, uh, April is Limb Difference Awareness Month, um, which is just it's. You know, there's a lot of different months of the year where people call out different things that we should all think about as well on for a moment just to get better understanding and connection. So April being Limb Difference Awareness Month, that's why this is this event is happening here. We're right at the end to cap off a great month of opening up this type of discussion. Um, so uh, we, we our panelists are from completely different backgrounds. Um, we do completely different things on social media and off social media. Um, so simply because we, we all share the commonality of, of, of being limb different um, doesn't necessarily mean we're the same and have the same perspectives uh, on life in general or the same beliefs. And so that's what makes this event so special and important is we get, we get to answer the important questions with a lot of diversity of thought and feeling and, and experience. So, um, so again, thank you, Unlimited Tomorrow, for this on and with that the person behind all of this 
really the the, um, the muscle behind this whole thing. Uh, thank you to Jennifer Barbic, who is the um, VP of Marketing at Unlimited Tomorrow. I'm going to allow you, Jennifer, to introduce yourself. Thank you so much for the introduction, Abby. And um, it seems like we might be having some issues with the live stream on Instagram and Facebook. So if anybody's watching, I can share with other people. It seems like the live stream on YouTube is working great. So go there. If we need to live, need to watch a live stream, that's where everybody can go. So I don't know if we can post on social channels, but that's where we're live. Um, but again, thank you for the intro, Abby. Um, as everybody talked about, but I think I should reiterate. So at Unlimited Tomorrow, we make a revolutionary bionic arm called True Limb. And our mission is really to improve accessibility to high quality devices on a global scale. We are hyper-focused on our users, and we're also very, very passionate about limb loss and limb difference awareness, and that's why I've been, this is the highlight of my whole month. I've been waiting, so I'm super excited. And with that, I'm, I can't wait to dive into the good questions. So, Alexis, the first question is for you. I was wondering if you could explain to everyone the difference between an acquired limb loss and a congenital limb difference. Totally. Yeah. So, um, so... Acquired means somebody was, you know, born with two arms, hands, legs, all the limbs that you might typically expect. And then later they've lost it in life due to accident, illness, um, a myriad of reasons. Um, and then congenital is typically referred to as happening within the womb during development. Um, in some cases, you can be a congenital amputee because you've, um, you know, the blood supply was restricted and, and you can actually lose part of your body. And in other cases, like in my case, um, my, my growth was restricted due to amniotic banding syndrome. So I'm not technically an amputee. I just didn't get the chance to grow all of my hand. So, uh, it, there's a lot of different ways of how it can happen, but typically congenital means you were born this way. Acquired means it's something that happened later on in life. Thank you so much. So my assumption, but I could be wrong, is that there could be some maybe emotional or psychological differences with an acquired limb loss versus a congenital limb difference. And Christy and Kirsten, I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit, um, starting with you, Christy. Okay, so for mine, I was born with two hands and, and I lost mine traumatically. I went through a grieving process of who I once was and, and finally came to an acceptance. Right now, um, I do kind of feel sad every now and then, but it's not that same deep pain. I, uh, it's, a, it's a fleeting feeling, and now I'm kind of settled in and I feel okay as to, to who I am and, and who I once was. Thank you so much, Christy. Um, Kirsten, could you, I think you have a congenital limb difference. Could you speak to that side of things? Oh, I think Kirsten might have froze. Oh, no. Kirsten, are you with us? Okay, no problem. I'm going to have Kayla. Would you mind fielding that one? Oh, you're on mute, Kayla. <laughs> yeah. So for being born with a limb difference, it has to mostly do with the type of mindset because at a young age, you start to learn how to adapt because you know life just with just the one limb um, and you don't get to really experience the same perspective as people with two limbs do compared with the one growing up, you go through different kinds of obstacles compared to um, being someone who has lost it. And also uh, I know we don't experience phantom feeling or having those type of pains that people who go through losing a limb do. Thank you. Okay. Is that me, Jennifer? We moved it on. Sure that is. was a good answer. <laughs> Those were all fantastic yeah, was... answers. Well said uh, to Kayla about the special death. One question I get a lot in comment, YouTube comments and such is, do you get phantom pain? Because it's a fair question. Um, and Christy, you probably had some very different experiences than, uh, than me and some of us with that, uh, but, uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a fair question, but it's one of those distinguishing factors, for sure, from pre to post birth amputation, congenital versus non, anyway, okay, not, not what I'm supposed to be talking about right now, 
Um, all right, cool. So this question is for Kayla and for Jonathan. Um, looks like we might be getting Kirsten back. Cool. And, <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> um, so Kayla, no, welcome back. Glad you glad you come back. You know, you never know how these things are going to shake out. You, know, you might get bumped out forever, depending on internet connection. Um, so, all right. So, Kayla and Jonathan, um, this is a great question. Uh, so, how do you suppose the world feels about, or how we see that the world might feel about limb difference and limb loss versus what the reality is? What would your answer be on that, Kayla and Jonathan? Okay, you, you're on, I'll, 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 I'll field it. Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> oftentimes, uh, you know, when, when when someone looks at an individual that has limb loss, they see just that. They see the limb loss. They, they see this versus seeing this, right? Or trying to see this. And, and this is really what makes up a person is what's in your heart and your mind, not how your body looks, right? So uh, I, I think the reality of it is, is I know so many people with limb loss that are, are smart and overcoming and inspiring and, and, and all of these positive things that, that, that I look at, at individuals with limb loss, but oftentimes the world looks at it differently. You know, they, they look at it as, uh, you know, maybe a sob story or they feel sorry for, or they want to avoid confrontation or asking about it. Uh, so that, that's what I've experienced oftentimes, the, the way that we'll use it. Kayla, what about you? I feel um, very similar to everything that you, you just said. I feel like the world sees limb loss or limb differences as a foreign concept, not fully understanding the full reality of what it is to live with a life like this. Um, they just see a missing limb. They don't see the person, as you stated. They don't know that there's more to a person than just the story or what happened or just trauma um, or just seeing a person just with insecurities and maybe you're not, you know, you're a person like everybody else living everyday life and it's just the lack of education that kind of like gets in our way and gets in their way because they just don't know better. Yeah, good answers y'all and that's right, lack of education, lack of awareness, that's what we're doing this for, you know, and that's, that's what this is all about. So, yeah, fantastic. Um, this next question is for everybody. Uh, so, um, and I think we'll do 30 second blurbs here in a nutshell version of each of your, uh, uh, and I think I guess I'm included in this dude. So tips and tricks. What are your tips and tricks for living with limb loss or limb difference? And what I'll do is I'll just go down the order and end with me. Um, so quick answer, Alexis, what's your tip and trick or trick? Unmute, number one. Okay. Uh, I'd say add a dash of humor to everything you do in your life. I think it's really been made my limb difference experience a lot more joyful when I get to you know, have that little dash of humor when I feel like it's going to help me in a situation. Um, also learn your party tricks. Like what can you do in a crowd that nobody else can do? Can you put your arm all the way down your mouth and scare people? Can you, um, you know, dress up like a zombie for Halloween and like really make it realistic? Like just find your strengths, you know, and really play to them. I, that's, that's would be my first one. <laughs> That's good, Alexis. It's humor for sure. If you watch any Stump Kitchen content, you know what it's all about. Um, awesome, thank you. And Jonathan, what about you? Uh, I guess it, it, it's more of a, a, a tip. Uh, just try everything, and if if you feel you can't accomplish it, try it again. <laughs> you know, because you, you you'll surprise yourself, right? Especially those that are that are new to limb loss. Just try everything and, and definitely add the humor and fun into it, um, like Alexis mentioned. You have to make every everything that that certain people may view as a challenge um, as something fun, right? And if you and again, if you can't if you can't overcome that challenge, try it again and try it differently because you can do it. I, I agree one hundred percent. 
Um, Christy, what about you? Okay, mine would have to be work smarter, not harder. Um, I have door levers instead of door knobs, which is super easy to, you know, open the doors, okay? Um, instead of using floss, I use flossers. Got to keep these teeth looking good. Um, and then rubber grippers to open bottles instead of just trying to squish water all over me. So I try to think of little things to make things easier. Yeah. So. All, all the lists, that's my list too. I can totally echo that 100%. Uh, flossers, <laughs> yes. Um, Kayla, tips and tricks from you. It's very similar to what Christy said, um, but most importantly as well, self-love, understanding your truth and understanding what works for you and getting comfortable with the uncomfortable, not being afraid to adapt to things to fit your body, despite what society likes to throw your way or life. Excellent. That's it. That's excellent. Awesome. Kirsten, how's it, how are you? Can you hear everything? Are you good? Yeah, I'm good for now at least. Who knows? I took all the necessary precautions, <laughs> but nope. you never know. <laughs> um, I would say, you know, for... Oh, can, okay. oh, you can hear me? Good? Yes. Okay, cool. Yep. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I literally have turned everything off except for my computer, so I don't know why this is happening. Um, I would say when it comes to tip and, tips and tricks is... I was born with my limb difference or disability. So tips and tricks is kind of just like my everyday life. I mean, I definitely do some of the things that everyone has already stated so far. Um, so I guess I would say like just learning your body, you know, kind of going off of what Kayla said, you know, it's my tips and tricks is I just, I figured out what worked for me, you know, as I grew up when I was trying out different things. I couldn't follow what other people were doing around me because I was missing a hand, you know? So I just had to adapt and I tried to just learn that the ways that worked best for me. Excellent. Yeah, we have just your audio, but we heard all that. So thank you, Kirsten. Um, and then finally, I guess me, uh, I made a video about this once on my YouTube channel, but basically balance and patience, uh, they go hand in hand. Oh my gosh, no pun intended. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, moving on. Balance and patience. Um, so literally, I mean, balance, like physical balance. If you can, if you play a sport or take a yoga or something that's going to give you core strength to have balance, because all of you all here know there are so many times like open up the car door and holding like three things and you're on one foot and you're opening, you know what I mean? So like physical balance, but then patience is the overarching thing for me. Just be patient with yourself. Uh, be patient with yourself because you might feel other people might be rushing you at times. You might be rushing you because you feel a certain pressure to just be at an average speed at certain things. And we're just not. It's not going to be like that. So just be patient. Take your time. Find your own way, which is kind of what Kirsten and Kayla were saying. And enjoy the process. Enjoy the, the, the reward of having figured it out, whether it takes two minutes, one minute, five minutes, whatever. So that's what I was saying. Okay. Awesome. Um, so thank you, everybody. Those are great answers. Um, so this question is for Alexis, Kayla, and Jonathan. Um, this one's a big one, because this happens a lot, um, or at least often enough. Uh, so what would be your tips for when people um, stare at you in public? Let's say you're just going somewhere and you're just doing your thing, not even thinking about your body or anything, just on task. Whether you see somebody staring um, at you, or maybe they, they, they come towards you, they want to like, like feel your arm or ask you a kind of an abrupt question, jerks you out of the moment. Um, so what is your, here's your, here's your best response, your most appropriate response reaction based on experience, um, to that scenario. And we'll go ahead and just start with Alexis. This is such a great question. And I think the answer depends, depends, depends. So first of all, if it's a kid, I always approach that situation with love and kindness and curiosity because kids just want to know, and they don't have any filters. So I usually will say, Hey, I, I think you noticed my arm. Did you notice my arm? And then they're like, 
And I'm like, do you want to ask me a question? Did you know that my arm has a name? And I make it very playful and make them not feel bad for staring because sometimes they can get shamed by their parents. And that's, that's, that's not great because they're just, they're doing their jobs as kids, right? They need to be curious and ask questions um, and to learn that it's actually okay to ask and um, maybe not as okay to be, to, to stare. And so I kind of teach them in a kind way. Um, if it's an adult, which is more rare, but it does happen, um, I'll be a bit more, you know, straightforward, like, Hey, do you, do you, do you have a question? Sometimes I will just ignore completely. Cause I just don't have the energy. I'm like, no, 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 no. Um, but I, 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 like I said before, I like to approach it with a bit of playfulness, curiosity, um, and, uh, and a bit of education when I, when I have the energy, but anything that you do in that situation, depending on your mood is totally valid because we all have different moods, right? So that's what I would say. That's a very gracious response, especially very good tip. And I 1000% agree about how to respond to kids. Definitely. Um, uh, how about you, Jonathan? Well, yeah, I, I, I'm around kids a lot. Um, my fiance, she, she teaches uh, junior golf to thousands of kids. And, and we have a lot of kids that come to our program as well that, that do suffer from limb difference. And, uh, it, it just just like Alexis said, we, with with children, uh, be engaging and 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 be welcoming and 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 you know approach the situation with love because they are they're just they're just being curious about it. Uh, with, with everyone else, I, I kind of take the same approach. I'm very open uh, about it. I'm always willing to talk. As a matter of fact, I'd rather engage the conversation to like Alexis said, share a little education with them about not only what this is but who this is right who the individual is behind that because if they just stare and they see you and you avoid them and and that you know that that interaction will never happen but if you go and engage them then you have that interaction they'll they'll, they'll get to know you as a person and not the limb loss as as identifying you as a person right that's really good and Good, great answers, both of you. And Kayla, adding the thought of this doesn't I, this doesn't happen very many times to me, but it has happened. And maybe if this if this is sort of irrelevant, do you just skip over this part? But adding the element of if somebody really wants to come up and like just touch your arm, because um, I know that happens sometimes. And so anyway, that that being a part of your answer, Kayla, what do you thought, kind of think of, about that? You took it right out of my mouth because I was going to say something about that too. Um, just also just being a woman, there are moments where people can approach you and invade your personal space. Um, like I've had someone when I was wearing my prosthesis, grab my prosthesis and be like, oh my God, what is this? And to me, that can become an invasion because I end up seeing my prosthesis as part of my body. Um, so it's more of a like, hey, like, Let's just respect the boundaries. Even if we don't understand what's happening, we still have to remember, you know, like our, like our social etiquette, you know, um, I've had moments like that happen. Um, kids, kids are a little bit different sometimes. Cause again, like they're a little bit younger. I've had kids come up and be like, Oh my God, what is that? But it's, it's still approachable. I'm like, Hey, like, you know, maybe next time ask, but then I'll educate. And that's with wearing the bionic, um, or my prosthesis. But when it comes to just without wearing it in everyday life situations as well, um, when it comes to kids, I like to give them a character that kind of reminds them so it can have some sort of like, oh, like I've seen that before. I understand like the power of girls, how they're like, they, they have the same kind of limbs as us. So I'm like, you know, like a power of girl. They're like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. <laughs> um, adults, again, it depends on the mood. I've had adults just ask blatantly, just out of curiosity, like, what happened to your hand? And I would say, oh, you know, that's, that's private, you know? And they're like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I was like, it's okay. But like, sometimes you need to know the person first before you ask an intimate question. So it all depends on the situation, what happens and how you feel. Absolutely. Great answer. And you don't, there's no um, rule. Yeah. For how, in terms of, if you if you want to keep it, if it's private, like Kayla said, if you feel, if you're a more private person, um, it's okay to say it's private, you know. Um, with politeness and respect, mutual respect always in mind, it's okay to say, you yeah, know, it's private and that's all right. It's also okay to give an answer, 
Um, it just depends on who you are, and just like everybody has said in the moment. Um, but I think I think each of us takes a pretty loving approach and gracious approach, so that's great. Um, Cool. Thank you guys for all those answers. I wanted to kind of flip it around for a second and ask, um, what advice might you have for someone who does not have a limb difference? How can someone approach you in an appropriate way? Like, what are some tips in terms of making sure to be appropriate and kind and, and not offensive? Um, and I'm going to direct that to Abby, Christy, and Kirsten, starting with you, Abby. Um. So, actually, can you come back to me? Because I kind of want to formulate this. Yeah. <laughs> can, uh, totally. Uh, um, Christy or Kirsten, do you want to take that one? So my thing is, um, I would just say to be considerate. And if it's in the flow, if, if we're connecting and, and in some type of a, a way, like a story of some sort, then just kind of flow into it, but be abrupt um where it just comes off as kind of you know like rude or whatever then that kind of that kind of takes makes me a little makes me personally just kind of want to just kind of quiet be quiet about it or whatever but if i feel like we are chit-chatting and and i mean I'll, I'll give the story and we can have that really great moment really talk about it and and share some insights from one another so i would say just kind of go with the flow and, and relaxed with it thank you and maybe a little humor, like Alexis said. <laughs> That's always helpful. Uh, what about you, Kirsten? Yeah, I mean, I feel like, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep, it's a little choppy, but we can okay. hear you. Um, I feel that um, you shouldn't just approach someone and ask them what happened um, because you're basically asking someone their medical information. You're asking their trauma, if they experienced trauma. Um, I think it's best to first get to know the person, um, like Christy was saying is, you know, have a conversation. And if it comes up in that conversation organically, I think it's fine to ask as long as like, don't be awkward. You know what I mean? Just, just, it's just a conversation, you know, we're people, we're just people. And if you are, if you've already introduced yourself and you've had this great conversation and you know a little bit about the person and you ask and then it's up to that person with the disability if they want to answer or not that, you know, maybe they'll be more open to answering because you've gotten to know them as a human being and not just approaching them because of your curiosity. Um, and, you know, for kids, you know, cause that's more towards adults for kids. I think it's definitely, it's a little different because of curiosity, you know, and um, I'm definitely like, I'll express and I'll explain different things. And, um, no matter the way they approach, you know, I try to make it into a positive experience and show them that it's nothing to be scared of. It's nothing weird. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Abby, are you ready now? Yeah. <laughs> so, gosh, I can't count how many times I've been asked by kids and adults in my life, but, um, I realize a lot of times that even if it is an adult and it seems like it's, it, it, I, I realize that there's a curiosity itch that even adults, they just can't, they just want to scratch it and they'll just ask, have it cold point blank, just, I've never seen them, but, you know, I'm in line at whatever and they just, hey, what happened here? And it's just like, a, so I got, I have grace for that because I realize we all can kind of get in the moment and skip over politeness sometimes, but, um, you know, I think I, I, I agree with uh, part of the answers I've heard, and that is just in like if it ideally, if people were to just get to know us a little, like as would be natural, like w how long have you been married, or you don't just ask those questions point blank in um, public to people, like hey, do you have dogs? <laughs> oh, okay, cool. And then you just go about like self check out, like there you go. Um, you don't do that. So it's, it's more natural and, and respectful to just get to know somebody, or even if you're just having a short conversation at the checkout and you're like, you're learning just a tad bit about the other person, small talk. You know, if you slip in a questionnaire, that doesn't bother me at all. I think that's fine. But, you know, for there to be a rapport established, that's more natural. 
And the other part I was going to say, I was just talking about this this morning with uh, coworkers. Culturally, in, in the West, I guess, we're more curious and open about it. We're more vocal. And uh, what's the word? Just a little bit more liberal with how we relate to each other, strangers, social media, all that. Um, so it's probably not like this all around the world. Um, but it, here, it's a, you get that probably more than average. Um, does that resound with anybody? Because I think we were talking, kind of agreeing on that. There's other cultures that will just be like, hey, that's, 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 that's their business. That's something. I, you know, I, I don't know. Well, I won't even approach it. May I add one thing? Yes, of I course. Think a great tool that people can do is just ask. They can ask, like, hey, may I, may I ask a question about your arm? And that gives us the the openness to be like, actually, I don't really feel like talking about it or like, yeah, totally. Like, I think that first asking of the question is a bit more respectful than just asking. So that's a tool that people can have, um, you know, in the, in their tool belt for when they're out being awesome in the world. That's good, Alexis. That's really good. Cool. Um, awesome. So we have uh, something near and dear to my heart, probably all of us some way uh parenting this is a big one this is uh running my youtube channel app show parents of kids who have limb loss or limb difference reach out a lot how do i you know how do i talk to my child how do i train my child to do well at school how do they make friends how do they tie their shoes parenting is huge um, for this uh panel so we can cover this uh topic um so Anyway, with that, Jonathan, Alexis, and Kayla, um, this is going to be a question for y'all. How can parents help their child who, with a limb difference navigate through specifically social situations, making friends at school and just uh, dealing with negative reactions uh, from other kids? Because that does happen, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, uh, Kayla, let's start with you. Um, I've had a few parents message me and ask me that kind of question, especially when their kids are very young. Um, and for me, I always share my personal experience of, you know, kindergarten, I think was, well, it was the toughest year for me personally, just cause kids can be, kids can be mean. Cause again, as, as we said before, like there's no filter and they don't know better, but it's harder when you're on the same level at that time. But for me, what my mom did that helped immensely was it was just the lack of education because they didn't know. Uh, and then also I kind of didn't know what was really happening as well. Cause you know, I'm just like, eh, I'm a kid too. What's going on? I don't get it. Um, and they just didn't understand either. So it was more of like educating them in ways. There's like, there's books out there that talk about like kids, you know, in everyday life with a limb difference, those child books, the same way, like, you would read any other kid book. Um, my mom had asked for the teacher to kind of read that in class. So things like that, like when you're taking your kid to school and things like that, like maybe having that teacher have a moment to basically give a little bit of a lesson of just like life with a disability, even if it's not a limb difference, if that's what the parent wants to do, because I always found it helpful because the moment that happened, um, they just understood like, oh, okay, she's like everyone else. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard the book, Harry, Willie, and Carrot Top. That was like the book that saved my life <laughs> in kindergarten. Um, but after that, once kids were aware, it just became more normal. Like it just was everyday life moving forward from that. So it was just being able to educate can really, really be a big tool. Excellent. Big time. I agree. That's so true, Kayla. Um, Jonathan. Well, yeah, I mean, again, like, like, like she mentioned, kid, kids can be rough on other kids, but I, I think, uh, for more importantly, the best advice I can give to the parents out there that have kids with limb differences, just let them be a kid. Let them interact in those social situations. Um, but, you know, also when you know you're getting ready to go to one of these social situations, whether it's simple as taking them to a playground or taking them to a sports camp or, or, or taking them to school, 
Um, may, maybe have a conversation with the other parents, have a conversation with the staff, have a conversation with the faculty, because I think every parent's fear is acceptance, right? That their child's not going to be accepted. Um, but if, if they let them go ahead and, 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 and take on the challenge and, and, and get more confident by overcoming it and being involved more and more in those social situations, but at the same time, not being fearful of, of, of whether or not they're going to be accepted or not. Um, I, I think I think those the best best advice I can give you is, is, is don't be fearful of, of acceptance um, and and allow them to to be engaged in these social uh, situations because um, it'll just make them more comfortable and confident as they go along. That's pretty awesome. Um, Jennifer, sorry. No, that's okay. Um, so I, we touched on this a little bit, but I'm just curious about if you have any other thoughts, um, Abby, Kirsten, and Christy, about, you know, how can I help my child who does not have a limb difference um, be appropriate when we see someone in, in public? Um, you know, is it just the go ahead and ask, or is there some sort of advice that parents can give children that don't have limb differences on how to approach someone with a limb difference? Um, I, you know, I've read various things that where it's almost worse if you tell the child, like, oh, don't look and like make them, you know, take them away quickly. Like it's something shameful or, you know, so I just wonder what your thoughts are on that. Um, starting with, we'll say Abby, okay. unless you don't want to be on the spot this time no, again. Okay. No, that's all right. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm thinking of future, you know, if I have kids, how I was a future parent, how I would do, talk about that, which is funny coming from me so uh, anyway um but ideally if um i would just i, I would encourage just kind of playing off of what jonathan said don't try to keep fear out of the equation completely so i probably encourage my child to um be kind and be and it's okay to be curious but make, make sure to remember that it's kindness first so if that comes out in the form of hey i'm you know, so and so. What's your name? Oh, like you're you have something different about your arm. What is that? See, like the thing is, it can sort of for me. And sometimes, or I, I remember certain instances, it was sort of a tool in a way to to make connections in friends. Um, so to not be afraid to, um, not to be afraid to relate. So don't you know? You wouldn't want to say, okay, well, don't ever ask. You ever see a child with anything different than you're used to don't ever ask because that's not natural but be kind in asking or be kind in how you approach no matter what and so you know that as a principle i think that safeguards against there being any sort of awkward rude interaction thank you um kirsten oh no no kirsten christy <laughs> thing i guess is to uh conversations about differences not it doesn't even have to be limb differences but just about differences and how it you know if somebody was to say oh my gosh look at that how that would make somebody feel kind of introduce them to those things before they happen that way it's not this blindsided mm -hmm. type thing and read books there are some really great books like her like kayla's mother did that's fabulous um read them books to kind of introduce them to the possibilities beforehand. Thank you. Um, Kirsten, what about you? Did you hear the question? Were yeah, you on? I did. Um, okay. So switching back and forth, switching back and forth. Um, so I would say <laughs> that um, I agree, you know, Jennifer, what you mentioned, how like I personally don't think that you should shush and like tell your kid not to like stare. I think instead you should take that opportunity to um, have a conversation with your child and explain, you know, what disabilities are. And then from there, you can always grow off of that with books, with any kind of research, with, um, you know, there's so many models, you know, in the industry now that have disabilities, you know, show them all of this material just to normalize it for the child. Because I think when you shush a child, um, they grow to be the adult that stares and kind of invades your space and we don't want that to continue you know so let's start young yeah yeah that makes sense thank you guys um 
what might Christy and Alexis, I'm wondering what, if, if you have any ideas about what questions you could encourage a child to ask. Like a child without a limb difference asking a child with limb difference? Or an adult. Or an adult. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, asking the question first, you know, like, hey, can I can I talk to you about your arm? I'm I'm curious, whatever is really important. Um, but I actually wanted to back up a little bit and something I'm trying to do with my little one, I have a, a two almost two year old, is show them and and have them engage with so many different people that when it comes to seeing someone in real life other than their mom of course um it's kind of like a, a non it's not even that exciting because it's like oh yeah this is just one other way that we can be in the world um and so that kind of pre-work that everybody's kind of been mentioning about resources and stuff is really really important um so yeah like i love the question like hey can i can do you want to tell me a your story like can do you want to tell me about your arm like or like do you have a special word that you call your arm that i can refer to it as you know like i'm not a huge fan when people talk about my body in words that i wouldn't use like i actually use the word stamp and some people with a limb difference don't like that word and that's totally fair but i really do and so you can model that language and that models a it's like a, an act of caring when you can be like, okay, I'm going to use that language for you and I'm not going to impose a more medical term or something. Um, it's really making it like listening to the person's experience. Um, so coming in really, yeah, like with curiosity and asking if you can model their language, that's really nice. Um, but just, you know, can I hear your story if you want to share it? I love that. Thanks, Alexis. Yeah. Um, what about you, Christy? What do you think? to uh, questions about who I am, you know, do, am I mother, do I have pets, such like that, to where I'm not just a story. Um, and then also, uh, yeah, I would say a little, a little bit more than just about my hand, about me too. That way I'm not just a story. Yeah. Thank you. Deborah, how are we on time here? Um, we, I know we're so, supposed to go to comments pretty soon, but we have a couple more good bullets to, to throw out the panel. So. Ooh, it's going to be so hard to pick. Well, so I feel like I want to ask the one about um, modeling and acting. And then also perhaps like pros and cons of insurance and setting expectations with prosthesis. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I'll Given our list. Go over a little for the comments yeah, sure. Why not? Unless anybody has to jump off. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so um, I do want to get into this one because I think it's it's a topic that's really interesting. Um, Kirsten, Kayla, and Abby, I know, well, many of you have public personas and are out there, but I, I wonder, specific to the world of modeling and acting, how do you guys navigate getting opportunities due to your limb difference versus not wanting that to be the deciding factor? Like, how do you reconcile that when you're analyzing different opportunities and things like that? I know that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, Kirsten, do you want to go first? Um, well, I feel like some opportunities, like there are roles that I have auditioned for that the label was person with disability, person differently abled. So some of them like a lot of commercials and stuff like that's that's the role name that I'm auditioning for um, and I think part of me just understands that you know I have to build up credits and I have to build up uh, material um, especially in the acting world because I'm pretty new to it um, got to build up the IMDB credits um, before I can really get to more um, roles that you know aren't specifically requesting a person with a disability. Um, there are some things that I've done. Uh, I'm filming a feature film right now, actually, and the character has nothing to do with my disability. The character was not stated to have a disability. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a balance, you know, to try to find what different opportunities like that. Um, you know, I think it's also too there's been stuff that I've done in terms of just navigating when you're on these sets as well. Cause I also think that's really important, not just like the, m gaining the opportunity. It's what you do on set. Um, 
I've, you know, learned that a lot of companies that, you know, I work with, sometimes they want to make sure like my prosthesis is seen. So when it comes to wardrobe, um, I try on a lot of outfits because they want everything to match, you know, so being able to know that knowledge and going into fittings and letting the stylist know like, hey, this might be what they want. So it might help you to like select different things or um, sometimes different companies, if you have multiple uh, prosthetics, they might request like specific ones. Um, I've had that happen to me. Um, I also too, like it's knowing your boundaries. Um, I've worked on a set before with a really, really great director, very open to learning and becoming educated, um, met with me one-on-one -on -one and I helped, I consulted on this uh, project and helped build the scene that I was in because he wanted it to be accurate. And, um, you know, there was parts where I was like, I don't want, like I was using lotion instead of my donning sock to put on my prosthesis. I was like, that part is absolutely not going to be filmed. That is not something like I want on, you know, on a project, you know, me putting on lotion, you know, to get a prosthesis on. And it's kind of setting boundaries like that. And, um, th that, per that director was incredibly like respectful and understanding. And so I think it's a lot of things. Know, know your boundaries, know what you're comfortable with on set, um, speaking up for yourself and, um, just little tips like the clothing thing you kind of learn uh, through more projects that you do. Oh, we lost Kirsten oh. again. So, um, that's okay. Um, Kayla, I wonder what your thoughts are on that topic. I know you've done a lot of modeling work and have a lot of experience in that area. So for me, I take a different approach for me when it comes to roles that say, you know, people with disabilities, I think that's fine because it could be the same thing of like me auditioning for a role that says, you know, models with curly hair, you know, and people don't think twice about it. Why do we need to think twice about disabilities? It's part of life. So why not? Um, but also auditioning for roles going against the norm, meaning even if it is just something that has nothing to do with disabilities, I know my agency is really, really big on just sending models to those casting calls anyways because they just don't know that there are more people out there that fit the role, even if they do have disabilities. Um, so it's more being able to just push against what society doesn't know yet, because they just don't know. So you have to put yourself out there in order to, that's what I do at least. Like I put myself out there, even if it's not something that is geared towards someone with a disability, because now it can be. Um, just like for an example, um, I opened up for like Pretty Little Thing, dancing wise, that wasn't something that's never been done before. But they just saw one that I was a model and they just noticed that I danced too. And we just figured out a way to kind of correlate that into, you know, the the campaign, the, the swimwear week, and it became like this breaking of a barrier thing because it's just never been done before. So going against the grain can create barrier breaks is what I like to say. And on jobs, it's really important to feel comfortable expressing what you need, what you are not comfortable with. Because I know there are some models who have disabilities who are afraid to speak up because they feel like they won't get the opportunity again. But at the same time, you should feel you are allowed to speak up because this is what you need for your body. Um, I've been on sets where I would see, I mean, I, I've been on many, many sets where campaigns are very genuine and it's very beautiful and I love it. And But there's also sets where they just want to just have that inclusiveness or maybe they just kind of lack the education of what it means to have someone with a disability on set. Um, for example, someone who was like below the knee amputee, sometimes you need different type of shoes because of the specific prosthetic and they didn't um, provide that and she was afraid to say something. And you shouldn't feel afraid to say something because if they're wanting you to do this, they should try to understand what your body entails because they maybe just don't know and you just need to like let them know. 
or a wheelchair user may consider this accessibility throughout the whole thing because you have the same amount of right to be in the same space as everybody else. So there are so many things and it's just mostly just lack of education and being brave enough to one speak up and go after the thing that you want to despite thinking that you can't because you can. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Thank you very much. I know um, <laughs> I know we're getting close on time here, and I want to get to a couple um, questions from the audience. We still have many great questions um, left to ask, so maybe we'll do another live panel event. You guys have been absolutely fantastic, but I want to take a few questions from the audience, if you don't mind. Um, so one that came in through our... Um, through the post, the poll that we did on Instagram was, they literally asked, um, why why is everyone with a limb difference so awesome? So I was wondering if anybody wanted to hear that. The answer is obvious. <laughs> That's what I thought too. Um, but on a serious note, um, that we got a couple questions about um, what the right age is to fit a child for a prosthesis. And I asked one of our, um, someone from our clinical team here at Unlimited Tomorrow what the official, you know, the official, you know, what a prosthetist would say. And he said um, he learned in school fit when sit so that, that you could fit a child for a prosthesis when they're able to sit. Um, here at Unlimited Tomorrow, we can fit children as young as six to seven years old. But I just wonder, for those of you that have a congenital limb difference and, you know, were young, what would you recommend? Like, what was your what was your um, experience and what would you recommend to parents? Yeah, go ahead, Alexis. So um, this may not be the most popular opinion, but it's my own personal opinion. I'm just going to put it out there based on my experience with my life. So when I was born, it was a surprise and the doctors thought it was like this big emergency and they whisked me away and did all these tests and they thought something was wrong with me, blah, blah, blah. And eventually my dad was like, she's fine. She's just missing a hand, you know, thank goodness. Um, but still, you know, within the medical model, they, they insisted that I wear a prosthetic very early. And so I had a number of them as a child, but, um, my mom says that, you know, when I had, when I was about like somewhere between 12 and 18 months, I had one that was body powered and they put it on me and it was like, my reaction was kind of like how, you know, when you put like a shirt on a cat and they, when you put a shirt on a cat, they just, they're kind of like, <laughs> and they like fall off stuff. So what? that was me. I was like, what? I don't understand. And then luckily my parents didn't force anything. I guess I would go to school. I'd take it off and I put it on the windowsill and leave it there until the end of the day. And then my teacher was like, she's not wearing this. And they were like, mm, that sounds just like her. Um, and so they didn't force it. And what I love about that is that that gave me the opportunity to try my life in multiple different ways. So I think like Jonathan said earlier, I got to try everything with the body I was given, the body that I was, you know, given to adapt to in, in this world of two-handed things. And that gave me the confidence and the strength to know that if I needed to, like if I broke my prosthetic or didn't have one or couldn't afford one, I didn't need to personally rely on it for my well-being. I, I knew how to, you know, take care of myself. I knew how to adapt and use the body that I was given. So I was, I prefer to give kids that opportunity um, and let prosthetics be a choice that they can make if and when they're ready at any age, whether they're four or 44 or 104. Um, and that's my opinion and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> awesome. Um, Kayla, yeah. Um, I feel very similar actually. Um, so I think it also has to do with the transition period of when I was born into now, because when I was younger, we didn't have uh, myoelectric, we had passive. Um, and my mother personally was just not a fan of that because she didn't see the benefit of that, except it being a cosmetic thing that just kind of hides my limb difference. Uh, so in essence, I think it's more on deciding how that person feels. And most importantly, as long as they feel confident and love their limb difference first is so, so important before taking the next step of adding a prosthetic to the game because it should be seen at least this is in my opinion as a tool you know it shouldn't be something to kind of hide your insecurities it should be something that just to be an asset to your life so as long as it's mm -hmm. done in that way i think that's the most most important thing uh, 
again, I think if my electric prosthetics were brought in when I was younger, maybe it's something that I would have liked to include because it is harder now me being older using my prosthetic in a daily basis because I have no idea how to operate life as a two-handed person. It's like another way that I have to adapt in order to use my prosthetic. So maybe if I was younger, because I know some people who use their prosthetics at a younger age, they have a better um, way of using them compared to just hopping into it now as, as an adult. But again, um, I just think it's more about making sure the reasoning as to why you want to wear one is the most important thing as to why you're going to get one. Mm-hmm. That's great. Thank you so I would much. I should try to respond if my mic works. Um, I, ha- yes. I had a passive prosthesis when I was a baby, and I would hit it off all the time. I never, ever used it. And um, I never felt like I needed a prosthesis until a year ago. Tomorrow will actually be the one-year anniversary of my first myoelectric prosthesis. And so I agree with both of them that it's, you know, to educate your kid and like let them know of these options that are available, but also like follow their needs and what they're comfortable with. Because I didn't really want one and I wasn't really comfortable with getting one for a long time. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, I want to just take, if you guys are okay with it, I know we're at time, and then I promised the last question, but I think this is an important one. Um, It's from mother to an 11-year-old girl. My daughter is so self-conscious and always hides her left arm. Was this a phase you all went through, for those of you that have a congenital limb difference? What helped you build up your confidence around others so you could proudly show off your limb difference and not hide? I would love to respond to this. Um, Yeah. I <laughs> and then yeah, I, think I we was all bullied. Went the same thing. Yeah, I was bullied a lot growing up. Um, I, w- I was bullied a lot, and I think that contributed to me being self conscious as well. Um, I would always hide my arm in photos, and it's I didn't even realize that that's why I was doing it. You know, for a while, and then someone brought it up, and then I started noticing it all the time, and I think. I just got more confident in myself as I grew up. I think um, it's kind of like you, you become more confident in your body and what you have, you know, the the more you age and you grow up. And I think that's a big part of it. Um, but, yeah, I think it's, it's somewhat normal to be, you know, self-conscious, especially there was no one in my school that looked like me. I didn't meet a single person that looked like me until the end of high school, I met one person. And so I was mm-hmm. very alone. So I, I think it's very understandable. And I think just like giving your kids support is the best thing that you can do. Thank you. Kayla, did you wanna speak to that next? Um, I feel like this is a moment everyone goes through when someone stares. Like, I, I, I like a rite of passage, I feel like, within this kind of life that we're in, because we all go through this. Um, and I, I always see that it ends up going into two extremes, which either, like, it becomes, you feel self-conscious because it's just, like, the stare that's happening to you, or um, it can also have the opposite effect if you'll feel stubborn enough that you want to go against that. Um, and that was something that I felt that when I saw someone staring at me, I didn't want to roll down my sleeve. In fact, I rolled it up even higher. That's how I felt because my mother raised me to feel like I can do the same thing as everybody else. Um, She never allowed me to say the words that I can't, that I can always adapt. And like once I felt that first stare that happened to me, I decided to move forward to wear short sleeves because I'm like, you know what? If you're going to stare, then now I'm going to get comfortable with this uncomfortable feeling that's happening and live in it and just kind of grow in my own self-confidence. So that's the approach that I took. Um, Again, I'm really, really loving on my body. I I personally never felt insecure about my limb difference. It's something that's always been my favorite part of me. Um, It's not something that you hear often, which breaks my heart because I feel like we should hear that more often. And again, like I'm this dancer that's really big on just like loving your body for what it is. So when those stares happen, I always say go with 
how you feel about yourself mostly and not allow this outsider to dictate your body because it's your body. And I know you may feel uncomfortable and you want to kind of like end it, but the more you push against it, the more you grow your comfort zone, the more confident you get. And people who don't understand what's happening and look at you and see you being confident, they will respect that without even realizing it. So it, it's all about how you decide to dictate that energy and they'll listen to that energy. Thank you so much, Kayla. I think that's really insightful. Unfortunately, we have so much more to talk about, but I think we have to end it here. I think this is going, this was an incredible way to end Limb Loss and Limb Difference Awareness Month. I thank all of our wonderful panelists. If anybody on the call wants to connect with any of our panelists, feel free to send me an email directly and I can connect you or you can follow them on their social channels. My email is jennifer.b at unlimitedtomorrow.com. Um, I did want to let everybody know that next week, if anybody's interested in learning more about our True Limb product, we're doing a live webinar on May 3rd. Everyone is welcome to attend. We have a link in our bio on Instagram, and there's also a link in our latest post on Facebook. And with that, I think I'm going to end it and thank everybody. It was incredible. Have a great night. If the panelists could stay on for just one second after I stop recording, that'd be wonderful. Happy Limb Difference Awareness. Thanks, everybody.